This is Chatter. I'm Shane Harris. This week, journalist James Fallows on what is happening in the sky. So you'll have these people who are willing to fly in taking off the wrong direction or cutting in front of you. So it's, um, I try never to land in Gaithersburg when there's not really good visibility. So it is true and significant that Jimmy Carter did invent the modern post-presidency and in a good way. And we now think of that as a commonplace. There are you know, quite, quite a number of former presidents now, but it used to be rare. Our mantra every day in China was, it's always more interesting than horrible. And it was high levels of, of, of both. James Fallows, welcome to Chatter. It's so great to have you on the podcast. Shane, it is my pleasure and thanks for giving me the chance. Um, So we are here today primarily to talk about the big question of what the hell is happening in the sky, which is the appropriately titled uh, piece that you did a few days ago, trying to take stock of some pretty extraordinary events in the world of espionage and aviation. Um, you've been writing a lot about uh, some stories that people may have missed, actually, with some you know really terrifying near disasters in commercial aviation, uh, as well as the story that we just can't seem to escape or get enough of the so-called Chinese spy balloon and other weather balloons that are popping up. Uh, So we have a lot to talk about, about what's going on in the sky, uh, which is actually a subject that you are really well positioned to discuss. Most people will know you uh, for your long and distinguished career as a journalist, as a person who's written books and magazine articles, as a chronicler of politics. Uh, You and I crossed paths or hung our hat at the same place when you were at The Atlantic magazine and I was at National Journal some years ago. The Atlantic was your home for quite a long time, actually, yeah? It it was indeed. And those were the the days when we were all working for that uh, empire. (laughs) Those Those were good days. I remember those as especially good times. And it was uh, at a time when it felt like journalism was 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 thriving, although not completely out of the woods of financial distress. I guess it hasn't been in the time that I've been in the business, but those were really happy times. And it was a pleasure to to work with you there, too. Um, but you are also a pilot um, and you have written a lot about your flying life and you have written uh, a book with your wife uh, where you've flown around to different cities and towns and states in America and chronicled that. Um, so that you know, is, a, is a very appropriate uh, a credential here as we're going to talk about what's going on in the sky. But talk to us just a little bit about your life as a pilot, when you started flying and, you know, and how often you do it now. So I uh, thanks for, for asking and for the setup. So I grew up in small town Southern California, right near an Air Force base, where in fact B-52s were based. And I had always been interested in this uh, realm of activity. And as a Boy Scout, I was going out for you know indoctrination or familiarization trips at the Air Force Base. And um, then when I was actually in college, in my first week in college, I imagined, oh, I'll try to, this will be a time to get some uh, pilot lessons. It didn't work out then and for a long time afterwards. And as you know, Shane, I worked on the Jimmy Carter campaign in 1976 and for a couple of years in the White House with him. And whenever I could, I would fly on the, you know, up in the front part of the of the campaign planes. And it mm. was the first time I'd ever seen what an airport looks like when you're heading towards it from the cockpit as opposed mm. to looking sideways from the passenger seats on one of the uh, flights of Peanut One with mm. Jimmy Carter back in 1976. I finally got a license, uh, you know, got, got, had time, had time and money to get formal training a little more than 25 years ago and got one of the first, I uh, got our own airplane in 2000 when these planes with parachutes for the entire plane came onto the market as a revolutionary <laughs> device. And we've had planes wow. since then. We flew them pretty frequently. I had my most recent proficiency che- proficiency check um, in California about 10 days ago. Wow. And, and is flying for you, has it, is it, do you consider it more like a hobby? Is it a form of transportation? Is it all of the above? Well, you can rationalize, and people in this uh, general <laughs> aviation world do, that this is efficient, <laughs> or, you know, it sa- saves time. And there are some journeys I've made, like from the D.C. area to eastern Tennessee, or from one part of Wisconsin to one part of the Dakotas, where it's faster to do that by small plane than most other ways. Um, the honest uh, judgment is that 
you know, if there's anything you have to do for time sensitive reasons, you want to go by airlines just because the way you get in trouble with a little plane is if you have to get there uh, despite bad weather. So I mainly like it. Uh, I, there are two things I really love about it. One is the complete absorption that it requires mm -hmm. that there are, you can't worry about other things that are going on when you are flying the plane and thinking about the next 10 things that are going to happen. The other is the view of the world from 2000 feet up, which really is a remarkably beautiful and instructive view of the world. In the East Coast, you can see where the gaps are in the Appalachian. So why mm -hmm. people, you know, went where they did and why, why cities are by, uh, you know, rivers and what things people are hiding about their cities, the things mm -hmm. they can put on the fringes, whether it's quarries or car dumps or prisons and the way that they grow. So I, I just find it, um, you know, it's like the childhood dream uh, that I think many people have where you suddenly you're lifting up and flying over your town. I mm -hmm. still have that. And it sounds like it suits your journalist's eye and instinct pretty well, too. I, I think that there is a kind of, especially for the U.S. continent, there's a narrative of American settlement and politics and economics and all the rest that conforms to the layout of the American continent. So it's fun to be able to see that. Yeah. That's great. Well, so we're going to talk about uh, things up in the air and we'll get to the balloon. Uh, but first, I want to talk uh, to you, and you've been writing about the, this recently, some near disasters at U.S. airports, truly, truly terrifying incidents that could have killed hundreds of people. And, and I'm kind of surprised, I think, by the comparatively uh, little attention they seem to be getting. I mean, relative to the balloon, everything is sort of being eclipsed. But these are really <laughs> incidents that that most people may not have even heard about. And as you wrote in a piece recently um, commenting on the high level of attention that was being paid to the balloon, that there's a there's a bigger problem happening closer to the ground. Um, so let's let's start with the incident that happened at Austin Bergstrom Airport on February 4th. Uh, this involved a, a Boeing 767 flown by FedEx and a 737 flown by Southwest. You go into a lot of detail on your blog about what happened here. Walk us through th this incident and and help us understand why this was so significant and could have been uh, so disastrous. So the this to me was, and I think to many people who have some aviation familiarity, it was genuinely a shocking episode. And and, and um, we'll get later on to whether it's a bellwether or not. But the, to set the, the landscape, this was before dawn. So again, night flying is different from daytime flying just because you can't see. And there are things you can see more easily like lights, but things, many things that are, are harder to see. And also it was an extremely bad weather. There was quite low fog. Um, it seems likely that the, the air traffic controllers in the tower at Austin Bergstrom Airport could not see the runway and they could not see where the planes on the runway were. And in these circumstances of extremely uh, low clouds, um, you know, just the worst visibility you can think of, this FedEx plane had been cleared for landing on what's called a CAT-3 uh, landing. And what that means in short, essentially it's an automatic self-landing capacity of the airplane. There are certain airports that are equipped with the right kind of avionics and certain airplanes that have the right kind of equipment, that the plane can literally fly itself all the way to a touchdown. Mm -hmm. And that is what, because the weather was so bad, the, um, the FedEx plane had been cleared for a CAT-3 approach on this one runway at Austin. Um, when the, uh, after the plane had been given that clearance, the tower controller then cleared the Southwest plane to go onto the same runway and, and take off. And there were two things that really have stuck in the mind of, of the avian, aviation world about the episode. Um, number one was that, that you would make this, that the controller would make this clearance at all. It's one thing if it's a sunny afternoon where the plane inbound could see what was happening from three or four miles away and just allow for clearance. And the last landing I made, uh, you know, a, uh, a week ago in San Diego with my, my little airplane, I was cleared to land behind a small plane that was only a mile and a half ahead of me, but mm. I could see him, he could see me, you know, et cetera. This was in the dark and low clouds, there was this clearance. The other was the Southwest plane had said it was ready to go. And then apparently it just sat on the runway for 30 seconds, a minute or whatever, and didn't move as this other plane was bearing down on it. 
and the controller again apparently could not see what was going on. So what then happened is that the FedEx plane, whenever it broke out of the clouds and suddenly could see in front of itself, saw that there was another airplane right in front of it where it was about to land. The FedEx plane presumably had only you know a handful of people aboard, but the Southwest plane was full of people, of crew and uh, and and uh, and passengers. And so the FedEx plane took control at that time. Um, first, it yelled to the Southwest plane abort, meaning to try to stop its takeoff roll if it could, so that it didn't climb up into the uh, the FedEx plane's uh, path. And the other is the FedEx plane immediately began the so-called missed approach or go-around procedure, where it was climbing up away from the runway. Uh, this was the FedEx crew saying this. The tower seemed not to be involved at all. Hmm. And from the animations, it appears that the planes, the planes came closer to a catastrophic crash than any episode we know about in recent decades. And so that, that, is, um, that is what happened in Austin. So there's so many questions that this, this brings up. And, and, you know, and usually when we think about aviation disasters, at least in the popular imagination, we think about you know, planes that maybe experience some mechanical catastrophe in the air and they crash. Uh, or you know they maybe even go missing, but we should emphasize too that the the worst in terms of casualties, loss of human life, aviation disaster was from a collision uh, in Tenerife on the Canary Islands in the late 1970s. So here we are, you know, some four decades later, we haven't had an incident like that, and it comes so close to happening again. I want to talk about that that moment where those 30 seconds you mentioned when the Southwest plane is kind of halted at the runway. It's, it hasn't kind of come around the runway to start the takeoff. Do we have any sense of why the pilot didn't move? He knew a FedEx plane was inbound, right? So why doesn't he, you know, hurry up and get, and get into the air? Uh, you, you would think, and that is one of the several qu- urgent questions that the investigators will be uh, making about this, this incident. There's a weirdo aspect of aviation safety investigations that when there are, when there's, you know, an actual accident, we all know the NTSB is flocking there. If there's something that doesn't actually cause any injury or death or physical damage, the NTSB is not automatically involved. And so I think there will be some kind of provisions to make sure the NTSB is is involved here. And they will want to know um, why the controller cleared the plane onto the runway, why the Southwest plane was taking so long after it had said, uh, we're, we're ready, ready to go, what was happening there. Um, a, a possible impediment to investigation is that Weirdly, um, airliners have uh, cockpit, cockpit voice recorders. What the people in the plane are saying to the control tower, that's all on public record. That's all recorded. What they're saying to each other inside the cockpit is on a cockpit voice report recorder. And most of these have only a two-hour runtime. Mm-hmm. And then they re-record. And this Southwest plane went on, I think, to Cancun or someplace. So it would have over-recorded whatever the pilots were saying to each other, which uh, I think, uh, you know, so we don't know and we will want to know. Can you imagine as, I mean, as a pilot and as somebody who obviously has flown a lot on commercial aircraft, what, what are some possible explanations for why they might delay? So it is possible that, um, you know, the, the, the crucial link here again is there's a, I'll go back again to the sequence of the transmission. So the, the FedEx plane says coming in on Cat three. The tower controller says you're cleared for landing. Then the tower controller puts the south. Uh, the Southwest says we're ready, and the controller says go out there. Controller doesn't say take off, no delay, or take off immediately, which are things which are normal in the aviation world. Interestingly, the FedEx plane inbound says confirming we are cleared to land. That is, it is registered in their mind, as it apparently has not with the Southwest plane or the uh, the control tower, that a bad situation is coming up. You can imagine possibilities that the Southwest uh, crew was wanting to get things going and said, we're ready. But in fact, when they got on the runway and they saw there was no visibility, they wanted to be very careful in setting them, themselves up for a so-called zero, zero takeoff where you can't see anything. You're mm-hmm. essentially driving into fog that you can't. Uh, whose end you, you can't see. So maybe they were doing some things that um, out, out of abundance of caution, but they knew there was an inbound plane. 
Mm-hmm. And so, so this seems at face value without knowing all the facts, like a failure of quote, situational awareness, mm-hmm. both from the controller and from the Southwest crew. And do we know, did the Southwest pilots know how far out that FedEx plane was? <sighs> If they were listen, they should have been listening to the. Now that, that's an interesting question you ask in this way. Uh, when you, when a plane is taxiing for takeoff, um, it it is talking with the ground controller in a certain airport, and you're talking with ground but not tower until you switch to tower when you're ready to go. So it is conceivable that, and I hadn't thought of this, that the Southwest plane might have been talking to gra- ground and not tower, and so did not hear the original clearance to land. But they certainly heard, because this was all in the same frequency, uh, the FedEx crew saying, confirming, we're cleared to land, we're, we're three miles out. So they should have been aware. And it's not uncommon, am I right, for planes to take off and land from the same runway in a situation like this. In other words, the, the Southwest pilot wasn't misdirected onto the wrong runway. That does happen. Uh, that does happen, and that happened at JFK Airport, you know, as well, well we may talk about later on. But this was this was the correct runway for both planes. It just there was there was it's not it's not just there was no margin for error. There was no margin for safety. You know, again, if it had been three o'clock in the afternoon on a sunny day, things like this happen. And and experienced uh, tower controllers learn the pace at which planes can go in and out. Any of the listeners who ever been to um, National Airport in DC, uh, they know the ballet. And there, there are restrictions about how far away, how far down the runway the departing plane needs to be by the time the inbound plane gets to a certain level. But in clear weather, this is something that people manage all the time. In zero visibility weather at night, uh, the normal approach would be for the, the Southwest plane to say, we'll hold for the inbound traffic, or the controller to say, hold for the inbound traffic, or the controller to say, immediate departure, mm. you know, confirm, uh, you know, take off right now. You mentioned the the, the, the radio uh, transmissions. And one thing about them that I found so striking, and I'm sure to, a, to your ears as a pilot, this was not surprising, but in the midst of this near disaster, which if you see the animations is really terrifying. You get a sense of how close they came. The conversation, it is just ice cold. They don't lose their composure. They speak in very clear, clear, clipped phrases. Um, is that is that normal in, in a situation like this where you could imagine people's hair is on fire, but their voice sort of gives nothing away on that? That is a, a crucial point. And I think I was surprised by the calm from one group of participants and not surprised by the, and surprised in a different way by the other. For controllers themselves, something that's been notable to me over the decades is usually the more tense the situation, the more calm and and reassuring the controller sounds. There's a very particular vocabulary and language of, of air traffic control. You just know that the formula of everything and they are trained. I've talked with controllers about finding ways to make sure the pilots and everybody else involved are thinking about what is the next thing to do? What's the clear instruction? There's no uh, benefit to anybody in sounding stressed. So having air traffic controllers sound calm is normal. The Austin controller should have sounded a little bit more upset, I think, but that's mm. <laughs> that's a different <laughs> category. What struck me was the FedEx crew, mm. which in the middle of what must have struck them as a near catastrophe did sound again, just like, you know, the seatbelt sign is coming on because yes. they were, they were, they had the, the presence of mind to tell um, the Southwest crew abort if possible. Southwest then said negative. They they, were, they they couldn't do it. But then the FedEx crew, while blasting their plane away from this collision and getting it back up into the, the clouds where they couldn't see anything and just going on instruments, again, sounded as uh, you know, Chuck Yeager. Chuck Yeager would have been <laughs> proud of the <laughs> of the calm. Just a little bit of turbulence here, so, right? You so. know, and to the untrained ear, I mean, listening to these uh, recordings, I mean, I had to go back and listen to them again because the the, the message abort just is the FedEx pilot just saying abort. I mean, you, you could it, almost miss it if you didn't know that if you hear that, that's very serious. And, and, and let me stress how unusual that moment was. 
It was unusual, number one, because it was another air crew, not the controller, giving the instruction. Um, I have never heard that before in my life. Wow. Again, it's a sound of it's a sign of the emergency nature of things, and the FedEx crew recognizing that they were aware of what was happening and the controller was not. And the proof that the controller was not was that a few seconds later, um, you know, abort would have meant that the Southwest plane would stay on the runway, slam on its brakes, uh, abort the takeoff. And Southwest said negative, meaning they couldn't do that. They were going too fast. But a few seconds later, the tower controller told Southwest, turn right when able. The tower controller thought that Southwest was still on the runway. Oh, wow. They couldn't see them. So that, that was the significance of that. He meant for him to turn off the runway and thought he had aborted the takeoff. So it was that out of control. Wow. So this was extraordinary all around. Um, but it is not an isolated incident. You mentioned the incident at JFK Airport. That occurred in January. Um, and you've written about this in some detail as well. So tell us about what happened at JFK. So this was a much more complicated um, situation than the one at Austin. The simplest explanation for it is that um, there were, um, in all the whole sort of maze-like layout of any major airport, which GFK, of course, is, is a main one, it's very complicated for airliners to taxi from where the people get on to where they take off. And there's usually a maze of cross-cutting or overlapping runways that you have to cross at certain points. So the plane, I believe this was an American Airlines plane. I, I forget which, uh, are these the airlines, it's American and Delta, I think in this yeah, case? Yeah, I think that's right. So there's American Airlines plane that had been cleared to taxi to the runway uh, where most of the planes were departing then. And of course, the departure runway depends on the wind. So your uh, planes are departing, both taking off and landing in, in, into the wind. And they were their instructions like those at O'Hare or at um, Dulles or LAX or any other big airport involved taxi to a certain runway and cross a different runway, getting clearance to cross a, a different runway. And the American crew apparently misunderstood and misregistered uh, these instructions. And why that was the case when there would have been three people in the cockpit, as I'll explain for a moment, why three professional pilots in the cockpit thought that they, they, they mixed up the instructions of which one they were supposed to taxi to and which one they were supposed to cross. And they ended up mistakenly crossing the runway where another plane, I believe from Delta, was about to land. This was less of a imminent catastrophe than the one in Austin, because it appears that the American plane would have taken its mi mistaken journey across the, the active runway just before the other plane landed. So probably they would not have run into each other and killed hundreds of people, um, e even, even at worst. But it was a profound error by a flight crew at face value and by controllers who apparently didn't know where they were either. So these things uh, together are to have these two taxi episodes, each of which could have been a real catastrophe, has gotten people's attention. The thing I find, and you noted it, that it was so extraordinary about what was going on in, in, in the plane with the three pilots in the cockpit is that they, none of them realized the mistake they were making. And, you know, I mean, we, we, we've seen disasters before where there's sort of, I don't know if it's a group think or people just sort of miss uh, one important element of, 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 of something that leads to a safety catastrophe. But this sounds like a fairly basic uh, uh, thing that they should have comprehended, no? Uh, yes. And let me give you a couple of sort of local color illustrations of this. So again, I have a little single engine propeller plane. And in my little single engine propeller plane, I have at any given moment, three sources of info showing me exactly where I am on taxiways going to, to runways. And there's one and a big uh, sort of, you know, computer uh, type display screen, which has uh, GPS tracking of where I am. I have an iPad which is showing me the same thing. And I have another iPad, which is showing me the same thing too. And so when you're taxiing, uh, when you're copying down the taxi instructions, uh, taxi to runway 27 right via Alpha, Charlie, hold short of Mike, clear to cross runway four center or whatever, you write those down and you are, most pilots I know are obsessive about tracking 
what what they've written down and how it's showing up on, on the screens. Uh, and it's like, again, triply redundant on steroids GPS in your car, because there are a lot of these things and you're moving relatively slowly. So you can see these things coming up and there's giant signs on the runways. This is this taxiway, don't cross here, hold short here. And so, so that, so most pilots I'm aware of, and starting with me in a propeller plane, this is something where you just view this as an area of huge danger. The time when you're on the ground, you want to make sure there's fast moving things around you that you are not hitting and the wings are not hitting and you're following instructions, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so that was one surprising aspect that three people were not paying attention. The other was the confirmation of how they had gotten um, mixed up, which is most of the transmissions between this taxiing American plane and the tower were a, a female pilot's voice. I mentioned that for a reason, just to separate them. Typically, that would be the first officer, the person in the right-hand seat, sometimes missed called the co-pilot, but there's two pilots and this is the one in the right-hand seat. Usually the the first officer will be handling the radio work for taxiing and the person in the left seat, the captain, the other pilot, will usually be driving the plane. There's a particular way you steer the plane on the ground that's usually done from the left-hand seat. And for long transatlantic flights, there's usually a relief pilot who will take over at some point, who sits in the cockpit too. So there's three people there. So most of the transmissions were from the female, I assume she's the first officer saying, we're taxing here and there. And then there's a time when the controller recognizes what calmly recognizes that this plane has gone exactly where it's not supposed to go and saying, you know, hold, hold position. Uh, there was a lot of excitement in the tower too, because um, th they saw this imminent collision and a different voice comes out of the cockpit. This is a male voice. I assume this is the, the, the captain, the person in the left seat. He's saying, confirming we were cleared to cross. And, he, and, said, and the tower says, yeah, you were cleared to cross a different runway. Uh, You're in the wrong place. You crossed the wrong one way, way but they're all very calm. Wow. Um, okay, so stepping back, and I, I think these are the two that of note. I don't think I've missed any other near disasters in, in recent months. Those are, those are the two. And it's extraordinary that there have been two like this. Do we have any sense right now, and I know this is still an investigation, what is happening here? I mean, is there are these isolated, just extraordinary events, or is there something going on in commercial aviation or the air traffic system uh, that is a, a deeper source of the problem? So that, I think, is the fundamental question that people are trying to figure out, because uh, for perspective, people should realize that around the world, there's something like 100,000 airline flights every day. And so just by the large of the law of large numbers, uh, it, it's such a huge number of airline flights that things, even uh, in a very safe, safe system, things could go wrong. So possibly these are two just um, ominous and similar seeming rolls of the dice that, that are just the law of, of, of large numbers. It's also worth um, realizing that over the last, what, 15 years, there have been something like 10 billion passenger, passenger journeys on U.S. airlines in which a total of two or three people have died in accidents. It's the safest system you can imagine. So on the one hand, people are saying, maybe we need to be hyper vigilant about this as a way to keep up the incredible safety record that American airlines, have, you know, generic U.S.-based airlines have. Other people have said, we will look back on these as the warning signs that of a system that's being pushed beyond its capacity. And we have two instances of, in one case at JFK, a profound crew error that nobody caught in, until uh, the end. And in the Austin case, a sort of system error that was saved by alert work by the FedEx people. And maybe these will be uh, the, you know, the, like the early um, people will look back and say, yes, we can see this is being pushed too hard. And I'm sure this debate is going on right now within the FAA and the NTSB and all the other organizations. And the pushing too hard, is that um, making flight crews fly too long without rest? Is it just too many flights, period, taking off or... Uh... I think that, that that is a good question. There are very rigorous rules, both legal requirements and union agreements on 
how long flight crews can work. We've all been on airlines that were delayed because the flight crew timed out. So for controllers also, you know, they usually there are on active stations for a very limited amount of time. They switch back, back and forth. Uh, so, but it's also true that the, um, everything about the commercial tra- air travel system in the U.S. over the last generation has been sort of pushed more and more to the limits of its capaci- capacity. This didn't seem as obvious during COVID for obvious reasons because, um, you know, traffic went down, down, passenger traffic went down so much, but now it is ramping up again. And on everybody in the system, especially at busy airports, there's enormous pressure to keep the flow up. I stress busy airports because something you learn by flying around is the sky is basically empty with the exception of weather balloons, unless you get around big airports and big airports, it's a huge traffic jam. And the, the, the scarce commodity is runway space. And so everything about the system is to maximize throughput. And so you can see both of these errors, including the the takeoff clearance at Austin, as a way of just to keep things moving. And so I think it's whether there are new controllers, new pilots, new everything, and just increasing pressure. And, and I think there'll be some system study of what's causing the uh, these errors uh, going on now. Do you think it's possible that there are more near misses, not not as dramatic as this, or or as just really really close calls as this, but you know. Uh, mistakes crossing the wrong runway, maybe a little too close for comfort on an approach. Is that more common than we might understand? I, I think that that problems are more common and there's a way that people can look at them. There, there's a wonderful program run by NASA called um, the Aviation Safety Reporting System or ASRS, something like that, where everybody involved in the aviation, pilots, mechanics, controllers, uh, even passengers, if they knew of this, can file reports which will be kept strictly anonymous of circumstances they uh, they, they thought to be dangerous. And these come out in monthly um, digest. You can search for them online and you can see a possible runway incursions, and you'll be able to read narratives of the last 50 that have happened at each airport and the safety lessons to be derived. So I think that that operational glitches are something that people are always on the lookout um, for. Um, collisions, you know, near collisions en route would be very rare. Everybody knows where, where everybody else is. Um, I think that, again, the runways are the main danger area. And for the last 25 years, the FAA has been sort of hypervigilant about runway incursions and has tried to have all these uh, signage programs and and training programs and all that. But that's I would think that the runways are the weak point. And so that is where if I were looking at the ASRS system now, which I might do tonight, <laughs> I would look up to see what, what runway incursions they have reported. Mm. Um, millions of airline travelers recently over the holidays got a, a view into the the ways that the system is stressed with these just extraordinary delays and this you know infamous meltdown at Southwest Airlines where so many of their flights were canceled or delayed. Is that kind of system failure connected at all to these runway incursions and near misses, or are they separate issues? Uh, I believe, to the best of my knowledge, they're they're entirely separate. And to the best of my knowledge, the Southwest problem is a specific to Southwest issue. There were, um, without, I'm not an expert on this, but from what I understand in aviation land, uh, the Southwest Pilots Organization and many others had been saying that that Southwest was being too slow in invest in investing in the kind of automation that would allow them um, agilely to redeploy crew and pilots and maintenance people and planes. Uh, Southwest, as you know, has a point-to-point route structure. Uh, United goes in and out of O'Hare and Denver and the other places, and American in and out of, of Dallas, but Southwest is mainly point-by-point. Point. That was used as an excuse for Southwest problems becoming so magnified. You know, a plane wouldn't make it to Hartford, Connecticut, then it couldn't go on in the next trip. But in principle, it should make things you know flexible in a different way. But it seems to be a specific Southwest um, issue of being laggardly in updating their systems. Um, what close calls have you had as a pilot in your career flying? So I have... Uh, <laughs> 
So there is the place where my airplane has been based on the East Coast is an airport called Gaithersburg. Mm. It's uh, the Montgomery County Air Park outside D.C. It's the closest place to D.C. where you can feasibly have a, a little plane. And I, my wife and I flew the plane from the West Coast where we've been living back in 2001 and parked it there on the evening of September 9th, mm. 2001. Mm. So for the next four or five months, the airport was just locked down there and, and you know, we couldn't fly the plane or whatever. Uh, what makes the airport, that airport distinctive now is that it has a big international pilot training capacity. This is normal in the U.S. It's cheaper to become a pilot in the U.S. than any place else. So you have places in Arizona with a lot of Chinese pilots and places in California with Japanese pilots. And and we recall the uh, you know pre-9-11 pilot training too. Uh, this one in Gaithersburg seems to have a big um, Israeli pilot training program. And there are a lot of them there, I think, learning to fly either as airline pilots or maybe military pilots in, in Israel. And it's an uncontrolled airport. In a technical sense, there's no control tower. And in the cosmic common sense term, too. <laughs> so you'll have these people willing to fly and taking off the wrong direction oh, wow. or cutting in front of you. So it's, um, I try never to land in Gaithersburg when there's not really good visibility. So I can see, so it's sort of the last 10 minutes of a trip are, uh, are always uh, demanding. The time I was least comfortable uh, flying it. So, uh, the, the big, the big threats in most of the threats in aviation in small plane aviation are weather related. Uh, the, the cause of an accident in many small plane crashes is the decision to take off. And so you can uh, avoid that by, by not taking off. There was a time long ago in Vermont where I landed on a grass runway for an event there. It rained overnight and the next morning I tried to take off and it took way, way longer for the plane to get up to take off speed in the wet grass uh, than I would have liked. And th then the uh, sort of the sh trees at the other side of the runway would have liked as well. So that was, um, I have not uh, been on a grass r runway since then. But <laughs> usually you try to imagine what's the next 10 things that could go wrong and right. think about at least nine of them. Oh boy. It sounds like as you're barreling down the runway, it's uh, not unlike that Southwest pilot thinking too late. We, <laughs> we're either taking off or we're going off the runway. Yes. There is a certain point where you've, you've gone, it, there's not enough runway left to stop. Yeah. So you're, you have to go up. Um, it's a bit of a morbid question, but it, it, it speaks to a fascination that, and a terror that I've long had. Uh, you know, people are fascinated by playing crashes. And, and there's something that is marvelous about the aviation system to all of us. And we depend on it, but there's always this, the, you know, we don't cover car crashes the way we cover plane crashes. And I don't know if that's just simply a function of the casualties, but why are people so fascinated by the dangers of aviation, do you think? So I've often wondered about that too, and I don't have a really good answer, although I'll give you my, my speculation. And as you mentioned, there are these cable news series on disaster in the skies, which you don't have about cars, even though a hundred people die every day in car crashes and right. entire years go by with nobody dying and in, in, in airline crashes. And I, I think it's a combination of the primal fear that more people used to have of just being up in the sky. You know, we're going to fall down. How can these things, how can a 747 actually go up in the air? How is this possible? Or, or a 777 when, when they're so huge. There, there's that primal fear. There's the out of controlness of it, mm -hmm. that the pilots are driving the plane, but the passengers have no control of what's going over and going on. And that is, has a kind of terror to it. And then there's also the the horrible imagination of what would that final 45 seconds be like. Mm -hmm. And that is just profoundly disturbing to think about. And so I think all of those are part of part of the, the attitude that you accurately point out. And I think too, I mean, it, you know, crashes like Egypt air and others where it seems like the pilots may have decided to crash the plane. And I think that's, that sort of speaks to that same level of feeling out of control. We're, we're trusting we're putting our lives in the hands of these pilots when we get on that plane. And we probably don't think about that very much, but it's every time it's true. 
No, it, it is true. And, and professional pilots as a group are extremely skilled and extremely well-regulated. And they have to go through these proficiency tests all the time. And really, you know, any, uh, any, the, most of the rest of us should have to demonstrate that we can still do our work as frequently as, as they do. So they're really good at what they do. But again, with 100,000 flights a day around the world, even a tiny gap in the system of psychological screening or fail-safe with multiple crews or whatever, uh, there can be consequences. And and that, I think, explains the, the sort of atavistic um, fear yeah. that, that everybody has. It reminds me of one of my favorite aviation movies. I don't know how you feel about it or not. Is um, Flight, the Denzel Washington movie directed by Robert yes. Meckes, yes, where he's this you know drunk pilot basically who experiences this midair disaster and he miraculously lands the plane by flipping it upside down and it's it's a, <laughs> it's a harrowing nine minutes of filmmaking. Uh, but uh, I'm curious if you see, if you like that movie or do you have a favorite aviation film that uh, there are probably a lot of movies that get things wrong that might make you crazy too. Well, of course there. There is airplane, which <laughs> right. is the, the, the greatest all of all, all aviation movies. And I, the only uh, one of the few movies I've seen in person the last while was Top Gun Maverick, which ah. was of course exciting. You know, there's a great category of just to divert for a moment of aviation literature. Mm. There are a lot of really wonderful books. My friend William Langewish, oh yeah, whose father Wolfgang Langewish was sort of the um, you know, in writing, there's the elements of style by Strunk and White, which is what we're all supposed to read. In aviation, um, uh, Wolfgang Langewish's Lang book of a Stick and Rudder is is about how you learn to fly. It was published in 1940s. It's still the classic text. William is a great writer about both uh, flying itself. He has a book called Inside the Sky and his aviation disaster books. There is also a book that I think most people who are pilots really like called Fate is the Hunter. Hmm. by a man named Ernest K. Gann. And it's about this combination of things you can control and things you can't control and how the thin edge of chance is what separates uh, something that is a minor burble from, from the end of your life. And, hmm. and I think Fate is the Hunter is, is the book that stays with me most in this genre. I'm looking at one now, West with the Night by Beryl Markham about, you know, an English uh, uh, female pilot in Africa long ago. And there's, there are a lot of them. Okay. Um, so let's talk about the big balloon in the sky. Uh, we've, 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 I've tried to avoid coverage of this balloon as much <laughs> as possible. Um, <laughs> it just keeps sucking me in. Um, what was your reaction when you first saw this news earlier this month and got a glimpse of this, you know, white sphere floating over the United States? So, so I should mention here, as, as as you know, Shane, but some listeners might not. I lived in China for many years, and I was living there from 06 to 11, and so I, I did some reporting on the Chinese military and other things in China. And so my first reaction was, assuming this is, is from China, at what level exactly did this screw up happen in the, on the Chinese side? Mm -hmm. Because the expl explanation for most things that happen in China is not some seamless, international, perfectly coordinated uh, system. It, it's somebody making a mistake. And, and the mistake in this case would, was going to be whether this was some person who didn't know what the winds were, which may, as we'll come back to, may be, have been a major factor, or was it some person from the People's Liberation Army who thought, oh, it's time to get tough on the declining U.S., so we'll send this balloon. Was it miscalculation at the top by Xi Jinping and others, which appears not to be the case of saying, yeah, yeah, we're going to really show the Americans, uh, but it was at what level? did this um, sort of, uh, you know, blunder happen. And I was not in the camp of those for the first four or five days saying, oh, shoot this down. We're being spied on by, by the commies. I mean, that uh, almost everything on the ground in the U.S., there's a excellent satellite photo of it. There are people, you know, everything on our, everything that is in digital form anywhere is being surveilled by, by somebody. So I wasn't worried about the threat from the skies, but I was worried about you know, what happened and how we could explain it. 
Yeah, and I had a similar reaction in that I I think I tweeted this in frustration, which is usually not a good idea. Uh, that you know, if you're getting worked up about this balloon, maybe you haven't been paying attention to you know Chinese cyber hacking and human Chinese agents that are in the United States and satellites and you know big countries spy on one another, and you know so it seemed like the the hyperventilating was it was a bit you know much, but it was a, such an interesting moment where it's it. It was almost as if millions of people simultaneously clued into the idea that, oh, my God, we're being watched from the sky <laughs> by China. Um, and it, it just it was it was so interesting to see kind of the the mass recognition of that just based on this, you know, slow kind of lumbering thing that was <laughs> drifting across the country for four days. It, it, I, I agree. And I think there were two elements that were were additionally interesting to, to me. One you and your colleagues wrote about, I think very early in the process, of the way that sudden distortions in the wind and the jet stream might be really what's going on here. And the same phenomenon that made the East Coast on the US so cold for those days in early February might also have distorted the path of this balloon and and it brought it someplace that whoever was launching it in China uh, might might not have, have known about. Um, the other is whatever were the, the the changing international dynamics of this. You know, if we have stage one in the U.S. of a lot of people going crazy, saying, "Oh, the Chinese are really really showing us," and then other people maybe using this as a saner way to think about a surveillance in general. Then, interestingly, phase two, you have some of the Chinese side being much more kind of um, apologetic and less aggressive than they typically are in a lot of these confrontations with the U.S. and saying, oh, well, this is maybe a, a mistake. Then we had you know, stage three of imagery where you had this lumbering balloon and F F-22 is blowing it out of the sky. <laughs> And, you know, which was looking like the stronger and more modern power in this. You know, right. It was, it was, you know, think, think how people who were declining, Amer uh, dec declaring America in weakness would think if there were a U.S. balloon being shot down by, by Chinese uh, fighters. And now you have a sort of reverse whammy on the Chinese side where they're saying, oh, uh, they've got, they have sort of a two front PR approach now. One is, these big hyperventilating, ventilating, mean Americans are beating up on our little balloon. And the other is they're doing that because they're weak. Mm -hmm. So that is that is the way they are responding now. And how the U.S. is responding, you will know better than I. Do you think it was the right call to shoot down the balloon? Yes, I think it, I think it was the right call not to shoot it down when it was over the U.S., both because of the tiny risk that it could fall and hurt somebody and the much larger payoff of just letting the U.S. watch it for those days. But then I think it was entirely, it was politically, I think, necessary. And I will ask you if you would uh, agree with that for Biden to get rid of it while still within U.S. waters. And presumably there is something the U.S. can find when it sees it. So do you agree that that it just anybody who was president would have to have dealt with this thing before it went off to the Azores? I think so. Yes. For the same reasons that you're saying that there's a political imperative, number one, right? I mean, and it is, you know, in talking to officials about this, they were not worried about what the balloon was collecting so much. I mean, and they were taking steps, you know, like using encrypted communications whenever it passed over. They weren't too worried about the collection aspect of it, but it was a violation of sovereignty. And they, and, you know, as they said, like, we take that seriously. And I think they had to demonstrate that they take it seriously. Um, and if they had just let it drift away, I mean, maybe it could have injured someone else or somebody else could have captured it. And then Biden would be blamed for not grabbing onto it when he could and learning about from the payload. And, you know, it's, it's our understanding that a previous crash of one of these balloons off of Hawaii, which actually back in June did not get a lot of attention, that the debris that was recovered by the military there was really helpful in kind of helping to calibrate and retune the radars, which then leads to spotting other balloons. So there was an intelligence gain that they got from that crash and presumably will get one uh, from the one that they just shot down too. Uh, that makes sense to me. And you would know better than I, 
Is the stuff retrieved from the ocean yet or not? They have finished the retrieval. So every, everything, as far as I know, that they they need to brought, bring up or they can bring up, they've brought up. And they've transferred it from the FBI to, I believe some of it actually went to Wright-Patterson Air Force Base, where there is a, a group that studies foreign aircraft and, and, and technology like this. So that kind of diagnostic process is now going on. Um, the three balloons shot down afterwards, which we can talk about, you know, over Canada and over Alaska and over Lake Huron, those seem to be um, gone without a trace. There's no, I mean, I think they generally know where they are, um, but they've been unable to retrieve those and they've called off the search, I think. This also brings up an interesting question I wanted to ask you. You know, now that the radars have been recalibrated and we're spotting these balloons more, of course, we had this kind of weird spectacle of planes flying off to intercept them, shooting down, which may turn out to be weather balloons. Um, the White House press secretary having to say from the podium, we do not believe that this was extraterrestrial life, which she said a little tongue in cheek, though, a little seriously. Um, this seems like a pretty untenable situation if we're just going to start scrambling jets and closing down commercial airspace every time we do because a balloon popped up, no? Uh, yes, I, I agree. And and. Again, as I think you have written, and, and I've written too, part of this is an inevitability of recalibrating the, the radar. Mm -hmm. uh, as I may have mentioned before, you see little balloons like this all the time when you're flying around at, at, uh, in, in, in either big or small airplanes. So I don't know what it's like for an airliner, but I know when I fly between, let's say, 3,000 and 10,000 feet, there are weather balloons you use... It's a rare flight where I don't see some balloon really? of some kind. Oh, that's Just because they're, you know, the U.S. Weather Service is sending them up all the time and there are hobbyists and that most of them are, maybe they're regulated, but not by anybody I know about. Also, there are parachute jumpers all the time and that, that's something you need. Wow. <laughs> you need to look for things going up and things going down too and not not hit any of them. Um, so I think that that, you know, once the radar, the radar has been set up explicitly not to see these things, not to register things that are very slow, that are very small, that have no metal in them, because you want to look for things that are moving fast, like other airplanes and that are made out of metal. And so I think it was for radar to be usable, it had to screen out all this other stuff. And now it's screening it in mm -hmm. because of the balloon panic. But I, I assume this will pass. And, and, you know, officials, when they announced that uh, the military had shot down these subsequent three balloons after the one that, that the Chinese spy balloon, noted that they were you know, floating at an altitude that they could have been a threat to commercial aviation. I and mean, is that, I mean, you mentioned seeing balloons all the time when you're out flying, you're not flying at, you know, 35, 40,000 feet in the cruising altitude range of a commercial jet. But is this a real threat to commercial aviation, balloons floating around out there at altitude? Because it seems like there are a number of them, perhaps. So um, I don't know, because I've never seen any study of what would happen if you know, if a airplane, if an airliner at 400 knots hit, hit a balloon, I do know, <laughs> and you, you probably know this too, that they certify jet engines by shooting frozen turkey carcasses into them yes. and making sure that they'll be able to withstand that kind of really huge uh, bird strike. So I don't know, but I've never heard of this being a menace. And you would think if they can withstand a frozen turkey carcass, they can withstand a <laughs> balloon, but but who knows? One would hope so. And you know, it also, and I've written a lot in the past couple of years about the intelligence community and the military's study into unidentified aerial phenomena, which I prefer to just call UFOs. Uh, and, and, and it's always, you know, it's sort of a, a, you know, an interesting story to write about because there's always that bit of tongue in cheek about are these aliens or not? And is the military investigating aliens or are they actually investigating things like drones and balloons? And it does seem now that we're getting some more answers about that, that it turns out that a lot of just maybe strange objects that pilots have seen or that military personnel on the ground have seen have, in fact, a very straightforward explanation that we're maybe only getting some more hard evidence on right now. Um, that that makes sense. And I I have not been an expert on this whole world as, as you have, and I've been fascinated to, to follow your work on it. Um, I will say I once worked for Jimmy Carter, who was, I think he declared himself open to uh, the UFO hypotheses. And that was part of his uh, wide ranging um, thought. So, but I, I would think that, that 
as with the, we can use these, the subsequent three balloons as sort of proxies for there's a lot of weird stuff out there, most of which will turn out to have a normal explanation. Did you ever see something strange in the sky when you were flying around that you couldn't explain? <laughs> Probably so, but I, <laughs> but I thought it was, uh, you know, a mirage yeah. or some other airplane or, or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you brought up Jimmy Carter and, and I, and I want to take a chance to ask you about him. We're, we're recording our conversation on Monday, February 20th, uh, and folks will hear this on Thursday. So, uh, events may have changed since then, but uh, President Carter and the Carter Center have announced that he has entered hospice care. Uh, he is the oldest living former president. I think I have that right. Um, so this is not an unexpected turn of events, but um, you worked for him in the White House. You were a speechwriter. Uh, uh, you've written about President Carter and the presidency. So talk to us a bit about what you're, you're thinking about him uh, right now as he is uh, approaching the end of his life. So I, this obviously has been on on my mind, and, and he did. He has been clear, sort of the typical matter of factness from from Jimmy Carter that he is. He knows that he's at the end of his life after a lot of medical challenges and being, as as you say, by far the the oldest person ever to survive the the, the, the presidency. Um, I've been, something I've been thinking about is the role of luck in people's lives and a particular kind of luck that affected Jimmy Carter. Uh, and without giving the whole sort of uh, belaboring this, he was lucky in many ways that he ever got to become president. There were a whole series of, of events that had to happen so that somebody who had literally 1% name recognition 18 months before the election was elected president. That Nothing like that has ever wow. happened before. And a lot of things had to break in a certain way for, for, for that, that to occur. He had a lot of bad luck when he was in office. There was the particular bad luck of the Iranian hostage mission, res, uh, rescue mission that failed because uh, one too many helicopters broke down. And, and Carter believed, uh, I think through all his time after that, that if that mission had succeeded, he would have been reelected. And I think there's a strong case for that. But there was, there was much more large-scale bad luck when he was in office. It was the beginning of the energy crisis and just all sorts of things went wrong. And something I've thought about is that um, only a country with as much going wrong as the U.S. had in the late 1970s could have given somebody like Jimmy Carter a chance to lead it because mm -hmm. it just was such a, a time of desperation. But he then had a different kind of luck in the 42 years of being ex-president, again, much longer by far than anybody else in that role, because he was able, number one, to create a new identity for himself as a, uh, as a global health crusader and as a global elections reformer and as a writer. He was a surprisingly good writer. And I say surprisingly with some back knowledge here, but he was an, an, an artist and he sort of made himself a, a, a new identity for himself. You know, he was he was former president 10 times longer than he was president. Mm. And so he had that, that much, and he won the Nobel Peace Prize. And, and he also survived in a way, I think, that to do something that only Harry Truman had done before. He survived to see his own reputation change mm. and to have a reassessment of his time in office and recognize that there were lots of problems he had and lots of failures, but also some significant, significant successes. So I think he was, he had ups and downs of fate. And this final chapter was fortunate for him, and I believe for the world, in his having such a long time to show what he could do and cared about, and for him to see how his place in history had been reassessed. Yeah. And it's remarkable that, as you say, he he got to, 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 to be an active participant in that and, and to view that and to, I think he probably shaped what the post-presidency, well, it seems like many presidents want to follow in the footsteps of Jimmy Carter in their post-presidencies in terms of having a good reputation, but also being active in the world, you know, picking a cause, um, you know, standing back from the spotlight, but being a part of events. He seemed to get to kind of to, to set that model for people. 
So it is true and significant that Jimmy Carter did invent the modern post-presidency, and in a good way. And we now think of that as a commonplace. There are you know, quite, quite a number of former presidents now, but it used to be rare. I believe that when Carter took office, the only former presidents still living were um, were Nixon himself, who had been, you know, it was in disgrace and exile, and Gerald Ford, who had just been turned out after his, his brief time in office. And f- because Franklin Roosevelt was in office so long and then died in office, and because uh, Harry Truman and, uh, and, and Dwight Eisenhower and, of course, uh, Lyndon Johnson and John Kennedy were all dead, this model did not exist when Jimmy Carter became former president and had to reinvent it. And so this is something, w- one more thing that he created and I think will be appreciated in the long run. Uh, And in a few moments we have left, uh, I should note that I've been referring to these great pieces that you've been doing on these, uh, on the balloons, on the near aviation disasters. And you're doing that uh, on Substack, uh, where so many journalists uh, seem to be uh, uh, hanging out of shingle these days. Your Substack is called Breaking the News, and people can find it at fallows.substack.com. So tell me a little bit about your decision to to, to break out on uh, on the Substack frontier. So I, I very much enjoyed, thanks for mentioning that, and I've enjoyed doing it. And the backstory here is, as you know, I worked for decades and decades at The Atlantic and had helped begin their public website uh, back, you know, decades ago and and had done for many years, just used it sort of in personal blog style where I'd see something, I'd think about it, and I'd, I'd just post it. It be, has become impractical for any sort of big time news organization to let individual writers have the controls on the mm-hmm. publishing machine. It just is, <laughs> there's too much liability for, for the organization. And so, uh, you know, as it must to all writers, that moment came for me of just, it was not feasible for me to have the controls. And so I was, um, uh, while a long time part of the Atlantic family, I just wanted to have a place where I had the controls again. So I, I've done that on Substack and it's been fun to do. And it sort of brings back uh, the, the the old days of the blogging era, where you could have tentative thoughts, you could work things out in public, you could have people's reactions, and I, I've enjoyed having this um, this forum. Yeah, and and one thing I've enjoyed about reading it too is it, it's very much like when you were doing it at, at the Atlantic, and and I you know and, and I was there at the same time as you, and that was a big part of their transformation from a monthly magazine to a multi-platform and largely driven by digital publication. Uh, and so, it, it, you know, you were kind of at the vanguard of doing that. You were really one of the more prominent and, and prolific people who were who were writing for the site, I think. It, it was something I, I, I love doing. Again, I understand the reason for this maturation for, for big time media. But for example, when we were living in, I'll give you just one brief example. We were living in Beijing, the time of the Beijing Olympics, and through enormous uh, Good luck. We got some uh, t- Olympic tennis tickets, and we ended up sitting in the front row watching Roger Federer learn how to play doubles. Mm. And what I mean is that Roger Federer had lost in singles. I think James Blake beat him or somebody did, and he was he was really just constantly, he was out of the singles tournament. And so he was having to play doubles with Stan Wawrinka, you know, the other uh, uh, Swiss tennis player. And they were playing the then number one uh, doubles team in the world, the Bryan brothers from the U S and we were sitting there watching. And the first set, every time the ball came to Roger Federer, he missed. It had been so long since he'd played doubles and he was the weak link on the court. And over the next two sets, you saw Roger Federer, the most elegant athlete ever to play tennis, Mm. learn how to play doubles. Mm. And so I just could watch that in real time. And he and Wawrinka won. They beat the Bryan brothers. They went on to win the gold medal. That was Roger Federer's gold Olympic medal. So I got back to our apartment in Beijing at 1 a.m. and spent between them and that and then 3 a.m. just saying, I just watched a miracle. And, and that's the kind of thing you could do in the blogging world and is, is uh, trying to revive that spirit. Well, I, I'm glad you have. It's it, That's great. And I wish you great luck, not that you need it, in doing that. Um, our very last question, as by tradition on Chatter, is I'm going to reach into the Chatter box, which you can't see, but there is actually a box sitting here. And I'm going to select a pre-written question at random, and that will be <laughs> <a> <laughs> our sign off to you. Uh, let's see here. 
Ah, this is this is actually a very good one. Uh, and apropos of just having a discussion about living abroad, uh, in what country other than your own would you most like to live, and why? I've lived in a lot of countries. Our honeymoon was in Ghana. I studied in England. We lived in Japan for many years. We've raised our children in Malaysia. Deb and I lived for four plus years in China. Um, the most interesting of those is China. And it's um, our, our mantra every day in China was, it's always more interesting than horrible. <laughs> and it was high levels of, of, of both. But the place that is... Um, most enviable to live is probably Australia. Mm. You know that that uh, that we've we, I spent a while there, and that is the only you kind of look around and say, "Can it really be this nice?" <laughs> so, wow. so if you can get over that sense of it's really far away, and how can it really be this nice? I think Australia, but then Malaysia too. So I'll say Australia, Malaysia, Japan, China—they're all interesting. That's great. And I, I love that motto of it may be more interesting than terrible. That's a good life motto uh, and a good thought to add on. Uh, well, this has been a delightful conversation, Jim. I'm really grateful for your time. And, uh, and, and it's just wonderful to check with you again and to get your insights on what is going on around us and uh, what we should be seeing when we look up in the sky. So thanks for taking the time. Uh, Shane, it's my pleasure. Congratulations on everything you are doing in print and online and over the airwaves and all their ways. So thanks for letting me be, par be part of it. You bet. Anytime. That was Chatter, a production of Lawfare and Goat Rodeo. Please subscribe to the podcast and find us on Twitter at That Was Chatter. Chatter.